Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the tattoo historian, and I'm joined by a man who wishes he was a DJ. That would be yeah. Pete Carmichael, yeah. director of the Civil War Institute at Gaysburg College, <laughs> trying to change the music on this show. Pete, how are you? I, I'm doing fine. John, I'm changing the music in part to try to impress Erica Uzak, who's our guest uh, this evening, and a student of mine who has, on a consistent basis, reminded me that uh, the things that I think are hip are not hip because by using the word hip, it reveals to the world that I am culturally disconnected. Isn't that the case, Erica? Hmm. It's true. It? It's true. true. Yeah. <laughs> Very honest. Yeah. And then she told me on a, a bus tour that I oh, no. threw shade. Is that what I, or she said, did you just throw shade on me or something to that effect? And mm -hmm. I had never heard of such a thing. But again, the third <laughs> evidence that I am again, I, hard as I try to stay uh, up with my students, I just can't seem to do it. Yeah, you'll have a TikTok soon. Yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> the music I was playing is the music of Grimes, and I highly recommend her. And uh, Erica was already dismissive of it. Erica, who should I be listening to these days? Oh. I'm just curious. I'm always taking recommendations from my students, and you're going to say you don't have any recommendations. I, like I don't know. Like, who do you listen to, Erica? That's yeah, who do you listen to? Uh, the Eagles. Wow. Uh, Weezer. Uh -huh. Arctic Monkeys. Oh, I like the Arctic Monkeys. I like the Arctic Monkeys. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's not so bad. Journey, Ario Speedwagon, none of those like 70s bands that were real popular in the Midwest. You know? They're good. Okay. They're good. Okay. I'm okay. already very <laughs> sick. So, I'm just going to really press her. Ready? Erica. Okay. Tell us someone that we shouldn't listen to that you don't think is very good. Mm. That's tough. Mm. Mm. <laughs> She's gonna say something I listen to. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is turning into the bus tour again. Like the Rolling Stones. Do, you, do you think like the Rolling Stones are overrated or the Beatles or? No. Nope. You like them? They're good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's good. They're down. open music taste. Well, that is a part I should say a little bit about Erica. She is a musician. Uh, she's in the band. You play the trombone, right? No. What do you play again? <laughs> the clarinet. clarinet right. I always get that. We have a research team, Erica, that always gets these little facts wrong. So, so I told you. Uh, some, more, some more fun facts about Erica. She is from Ohio. This is our third guest from Ohio, John, if you're keeping that tab. This is like the presidents. We just can't get rid of the Ohio presidents. Yeah. Can't get rid of the Ohio people. Uh, Erica <laughs> is desperate for heroes in Ohio. Behind her, she just mm. the Wright brothers. John, when you think of the Wright brothers, what state do you think of? I think of North Carolina. Absolutely. Look at flight. Ohio doesn't right. have that at all. Mm -hmm. And then she's claimed a bunch of presidents from Ohio that are they didn't associate themselves with the Buckeye State. And that <laughs> is Benjamin Harrison. He's from Indiana. He cannot claim oh. he is a loser through and through. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. No. Uh, we'll let it slide. We'll let this one slide. Right. So, Erica, she is in the marching band, and I should also note that she is a history major. She'll be a junior this year, and she's also Civil War Air Studies and public history. And she is this summer going to be at Fredericksburg. Uh, Erica, our audience has met two of your colleagues, uh, Ben Roy and Cameron Sowers, who will also be joining uh, Erica on the battlefields. Erica, I believe your duty stations are Chatham Manor, which is a site that a lot of folks have not seen, so maybe have been to Fredericksburg. It is certainly worth one's time to see this 18th century plantation that uh, interprets not just the history of the house, but it offers, I believe, uh, the very best view of Fredericksburg. And it's, as many people know, uh, in essence, the launching pad for Burnside's crossing of the Rappahannock and then going into the town. So it is, uh, yeah, it's uh, well worth uh, making a visit to Chatham. And then your other stop, Erica, I believe is the sunken lane and the stone wall discussing the Battle of Fredericksburg. So before we do that, I did overlook an important fact about Erica. She is an absolute devoted, devoted follower of U.S. Grant. 
She loves Grant. Loves everything about Grant. And mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. I think that's a, you know, that's a person who is uh, worthy of our devotion. Um, that's too bad, Erica. God, you got to Fredericksburg. They should have had you work at the Wilderness or Spotsylvania. Yeah. I want I wanted to work at Fredericksburg. I wanted to do the Sunken Road walking tour, and I also wanted to work at Chatham. So. So I'm just curious. Was there a reason for that, or you're just interested in this? Um, the I went to both of those sites in 2017. And I just, especially the sunken road, I just have this memory of it was my grandpa, my dad, and me. And right. It was a hot 98 degrees, high humidity summer day. And my grandpa got tired of walking. So my dad was like pushing my grandpa up the sunken road in a wheelchair. And it was just like a very memorable, yeah. just multi generational. That's very um, cool. That's, that's a personal memory for me cool. as well. I'm not trying to be the, the academic who puts the uh, the wet blanket over that memory, but it just reminds me of why people go to museums and historic sites as adults. It's those kinds of memories. You know, we often overthink these issues as to what draws people to historic sites. It, it, it often comes down to a family experience, uh, often something that's very personal, and in some ways even disconnected from the history of the place itself. And so when people uh, rightfully are concerned at the lack of diversity that we have at Civil War sites in particular, uh, there are again many reasons for that. But one reason is that poor people, I don't care what their color is, but poor people uh, often don't come to places like Gettysburg uh, with their families. And you can hardly blame them. If you are a, you know, a nine to five job and you get one or two weeks off during the course of a year, my hunch is that you're going to spend that recreational time somewhere else, you know, King's Dominion or King's Island if you're in Ohio. What's the big amusement park in Ohio? Cedar Point? Cedar Point. Cedar Point, yeah. That had just ridiculously scary roller coasters. <laughs> I'm not well, a roller coaster guy. Uh, you are? You are? I'm not. No, you're, I'm not. No. no Eric hurt. definitely is not. Are you a roller coaster person, Erica? Not really. I, I absolutely am not. I, it's, it's, I've done it once. I was utterly terrified the entire time. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry I moved a little bit away from that that story. I'm glad you're going to be able to give uh, to give walks there. So I suspect that you're going to have lots of questions about Ambrose C. Burnside. And I know you've been thinking a little bit about this. And then we're going to get to our main topic here in just a little bit. But I'm, I'm just curious what some of your thoughts are about Burnside, or what are your thoughts about, you know, in anticipation of what visitors might ask you? Mm. So you, you want to know my opinion on Burnside? Yeah, and yeah, or what you're thinking about how you might sort of, the questions you might raise about them, about how maybe visitors might, uh, their perceptions of Burnside and, and how you think you might handle it. Mm. Um, well, I know, like before, when they offered the position to Burnside before, and he turned it down twice, uh, mainly because he thought it was also McClellan who had the position before of command of the Army of the Potomac. He thought that would be a slight to him because they had been friends, and uh, Burnside had stayed at McClellan's house for a while, and McClellan had offered him a job in the years before. And he also reckoned was, you know, knew about himself that he said that he didn't have the, enough qualities. He didn't think he possessed the qualities enough to take that position. And I think it was good that he was able to recognize that himself. Right. But he ended up taking it, the job, because he didn't want uh, Joseph Hooker to get it, who was his rival. Um, I know that one of the books I was reading know that he was known for being stubborn. And I think that can be seen at Fredericksburg and that even as, you know, several divisions have been sent, according to Joseph Hooker, when he argues, goes to argue with him against more divisions being sent up against Marie's Heights, he's, he's still saying you need to keep sending the divisions on. And I think that his unwillingness to listen to his subordinates really hurt him, even in the day after the uh, 
assaults on the stone wall on these heights he's still wanting to send more troops and he says he's going to lead them on december 14th people right here are still still kind of well um you know eric i think that you're going to get some very interesting opinions about burnside because as you've just suggested uh, his determination uh, to continue the attacks even in the face of um, how utterly pointless they were is it sort of sort of goes beyond any sort of reasonable explanation and the book that i think i did suggest to you that offers an empathetic view uh, some might say too empathetic is william marvel m-a-r-v-e-l marvel's biography of burnside it's William Marvel has written just a number of very good Civil War books. He writes beautifully. And uh, we don't have the code up here because you're not a University of North Carolina author, Erica. Maybe someday you will be. Mm -hmm. But the William Marvel biography, and it's just called Burnside, uh, is published by UNC. It is in paperback. And for our viewers out there, um, I think that Burnside on the surface would seem to be not a very interesting uh, person to read about, but Marvel does a, I think, fantastic job in complicating uh, the situation in which Burnside had to operate and the politics, as anyone could imagine, were extremely complex. And the Burnside's decision to attack um, at Fredericksburg is in part a consequence of the Northern people demanding action, George B. McClellan not giving that kind of action to the people or to Lincoln, and certainly Burnside is well aware of that. Well, you're gonna have a great summer there. I'm there eager to come down and to see you and to see uh, the rest of the Gettysburg crowd. I just wanna again note that of the many things that the Civil War Institute does, and one is the conference, which we're all so disappointed that we can't do this year. Uh, Erica was with us last year and it was a great deal of fun. Uh, we're sorry that that, of course, has been postponed. It's gonna happen next June though, I can guarantee that. But what we have continued to do is to send our students out to the battlefield parks as Brian Polanka fellows. Erica, this will be her first summer doing it. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna do another show. We'll do it with you and the boys uh, in the fall and uh, get your impressions uh, of your first summer at, at a national park. I'll turn it over to John, let him just shoot away here because I should note here, we are discussing today Corporal Cyclic and his card. It is. A classic. It, it absolutely a, a, a classic that is, uh, I think, uh, not just forgotten. It doesn't even get the attention uh, that it deserves. Mm -hmm. And you can get it. There you, go. You, can, you can get that on Amazon and clearly in paperback. And it is an absolute joy to read. And Erica, in just a little bit, is going to tell us about her research. Um, and uh, so, John, I'll let you go ahead and, and start off. Well, also, I'm glad you held up the uh, the reprint of Corporal Cy Clegg and his pard for everyone to see. I actually have two originals of mm -hmm. the later versions of those, uh, Cy Shorty and the boys uh, on the March to the Sea, and then Cy Clegg and Shorty, the second year of the war or of service. Uh, I think uh, Cy Clegg and Shorty is, yeah, Cy Clegg and Shorty, this is 1898 copy of that which i think is first edition and then uh Cy shorty and the boys uh on the march to the sea i think that's 19 yeah 1902 so they made several versions so it's pretty cool that we're gonna be talking about Cy and the, and the and the guys tonight and uh erica i want to want to say you know this is an awesome topic and i'm glad you're doing it because this is one of the classics that's often overlooked and uh because we talk about another one which we're going to probably bring up later hardtack and coffee and size usually forgotten and thrown off to the side so what interests you in this in this book first of all it really grabs your attention you're like you wanted you wanted to research this a little bit more um well i was personally drawn to him because um dr Car dr carmichael had mentioned the book before and i found out that it was also of personal interest to me because he was from the Cleveland area. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first started this project, I went to the Cleveland uh, Western Reserve Historical Society where all his letters and there's just tons and tons of letters. And I don't know how he found the time, but 
he wrote he was just a prolific writer even in the wartime and, you know, and, Eric, Eric, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I thought to mention is the author of the book is Wilbur Hinman, right? Yes. So we should say Wilbur Hinman, and you can talk a little bit about Wilbur Hinman, who is the author uh, of uh, Corporal Cycling and his part, right? And when you're referring to the letters, uh, Eric has yes. been to Hinman's wartime letters uh, that he mm. Yes. So go ahead, I'm just, yeah. Eric. I yes. Get that background information. Yeah, yeah so I, I was looking at those letters. And then I, um, then I started looking at um, his novel and how I could see the changes over time of how his view changed of the war and of sacrifice and soldiers into his post-war novel, which is written in 1887, Corporal Cyclic and his part. Mm -hmm. so, let's go back to the letter. So yeah, you read this book and, and you and I talked about it. And Hinman's, again, letters, wartime letters are all at the Western Reserve. So you spent some time looking at the letters, right? And when you were reading those letters, what were some of the themes that came out of those letters that uh, you found moving or you found important? Um, one definite theme is that he hates the Copperheads who insist that they're going to do a negotiation with the South. And that he says that any negotiation is would be cowardly because if they were going to do some sort of negotiation, it should have happened before all these young men were killed. So a repeated theme in his letters is that they have to continue the fight. They have to keep fighting no matter the cost because it would make the, the deaths of his fellow comrades in vain if they just gave up the fight and surrendered to the South. So that's... That's how he gets through his war is that he he draws that motivation is we can't let right. the fallen down. We have to make their sacrifices. But Erica, that's that's nicely said. And I think what you have illustrated is how Hitman's ideas of union, his patriotism that we talk about on the battlefield as that these are men of duty, what you've done for us if you've unpackaged that, right? And, and you've unpacked it is the word I meant to say. You've unpacked it, you've shown us how his sense of being a brave and honorable man rested upon the continuation of more killing. And that in no way takes away from the idealism that I think Hinman felt for the Union cause, but it reminds us of how a sense of duty cannot just be reduced to a sense of duty. I mean, what you can describe, it shows us that his pride and sense of being a man um, could only be protected if the killing continued. And it's both, I think, sort of tragic and somewhat disturbing, but also admirable and idealistic. It, it's all of those things. And so uh, he felt that particularly strong because, as you point out, the Copperhead Movement, for our viewers who don't know what that about, is an anti-war movement in the Midwest, mostly in the southern part of the Midwestern states, uh, that took a very strong anti-war position. Uh, sometimes that anti-war position, at least in the eyes of many Union soldiers, bordered on a disloyalty um, and, and being, being traitors, being seditious. So that, yeah. What are some of the other themes in the letters uh, uh, that struck you? I was just going to add, like, he also adds that um, it, those who are complaining that they want to negotiate the war, that the war has to stop, are mainly the people who aren't there at the front lines fighting the war. So he's saying, come on down and fight the war if you're so eager to end it. Um, I would say another theme in his letters is that he, he definitely thinks that there is a gap of understanding between the civilians and, and the soldiers. Um, in one of his letters, early letters in November 1862, he enlisted in November 1861, Hinman did. In his November 1862 letter, he says, you at the North will never know what war is. And the thing is, it's kind of contradictory because he does depend on that home connection a lot and he continues writing to them 
very extensively. So he obviously wants them to try to understand something, but it seems that he's often frustrated on the limits that he can express it. And sometimes he's just forced to say language cannot convey what it is. You have to feel the experience. So he's definitely discouraged that they can't quite understand what he's going through. And then that discouragement turns into frustration when there's civilians like the Copperhead movement right. who are just not helping the war effort at all in the way that he sees it. So, Erica, this, that important theme, again, that you've articulated nicely for us, um, should we see that as comparable to the detachment um, or disintegration of relations between Vietnam soldiers and the home front? Do you see parallels there, or do you think that's too much of a stretch? Um, I think that might be too much of a stretch. I mean, think about all the things that Civil War soldiers don't have access to, like Vietnam soldiers, like they had television and uh probably a heavier media presence than civil war soldiers so you know civil war civil war civilians are getting watered down images and like harper's weekly and stuff like that yeah. they're not even though the photographs are out there it's still in order to get mass production of prints sent out to the public it's going to be you know lithographs and stuff like that that aren't capturing that same sense of the realism of the brutal battlefield. I'm going to let John jump in here and give us some, some broader historical perspective before he does that. Very quickly, I know this is a book, um, Erica, that you have read, Embattled Courage. I'll hold it up here for our audience. Embattled Courage is a book that still generates a fair amount of controversy. Uh, Gerald Linderman, who clearly was influenced by the Vietnam War, uh, he was not a veteran, but he came of age as a scholar in the 1960s and early 70s. And he was really the first historian to suggest that there was a, a, a gap, a jarring gap, between the experience of soldiers and civilians, uh, the very thing that Hinman identifies as well. Now, many believe that that led to disillusionment among Vietnam soldiers. I think, Erica, as you're pointing out, maybe that didn't happen in the Civil War. But nonetheless, uh, we see in Erica's observation and in this, again, very important book, this connection, this link between the home front and the military uh, that is absolutely critical uh, if we want to fully understand the totality of the soldier experience. And so, John, I know you have thought a lot about World War II and World War I as well as the Civil War. Mm -hmm. In these tensions that one finds between soldiers and home front, um, do you see commonalities here? Do you see differences? Uh, well, as Erica said, there's de there are definitely differences in how they get the information, how people at home receive the information, how uh, men on the front line receive information from back home. There are definitely differences with that. Uh, there is always this timeless tradition of uh, men who see combat, nurses who see the wounded, et cetera, uh, see combat and conflict differently than the people at home uh, who who uh, don't experience that kind of brutality and, and such. And, uh, but you see it in the First World War, you see it in the Second World War. You know, it's, it's a timeless thing that, that goes on for a long time. The really interesting part with Cy Clegg uh, with, from the book uh, for, for me that I, I wanted to touch on with Erica was the fact that this is another one of the millions of citizen soldiers who decides to put his pen to paper and try to make an impact. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, Erica, why you think Hinman decided to do this and, and what the work meant to him? I think he wrote it. I think he, going off of the wartime letters of how he was trying to get his family and friends to understand the war, but he found that he was often frustrated. I think that that continued to be a goal in his post-war novel that he really wanted the civilians to understand what the war was like. And I think that scene um, also, and that's why the book is used also for like reenactors, is that um, 
it shows like different aspects of what the soldiers lived through and what hardships they had to endure. Um, and also like the very mundane aspects of their life. Um, I don't know, if, could you pull up the page 93 screenshot? Page, yes, I can do that. Um, I've got it over here. Uh, make sure I hit the right one, <laughs> that's all. That's uh, this one, I believe. This one, nine, well, nine, yeah. nine, two. Yeah. Yeah. This is the canteen pick. The canteen. Oh, the canteen. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, this is the right one. That was the right <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, I was the right one. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> can you blow this, it up? I can try. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's about as big as I can go. I can try to make it a little bigger on here. Nope. Sorry. That's about as big as I can go with that particular JPEG. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, anyway, the, this uh, this screenshot is a picture of how he, the, the illustration shows all the different ways that a, a bayonet, I think, in this one can be used. So mm -hmm. one of them shows um, them using it to hold like a candle um, another one uses it. He's got like some food pierced through the bayonet. So it's supposed to be the civilians romanticize it as, you know, you're going to bayonet a Confederate a rebel soldier with it. But in reality, it's used for much more mundane tasks. And but he's he's also trying to explain like to civilians how life really was at the camp and really how the, how how much of the hardships they had to go to go through because um, Earl Hess in, um, uh, I think it was Northern Liberty and Progress. Yeah, Liberty, Virtue, he, and Progress. Yes. Um, he talks about how in 1880 society and like the Gilded Age, there was a lot more emphasis on wealth and admiration centered about wealth instead of self-sacrifice. So I think Hinman was also going against that culture that was centered around wealth and the sacrifices of the soldiers were perhaps fading and he really wanted the civilians to appreciate all the hardships that they went through. Uh, Eric, I really, that's a really nice connection to Earl Hess's book, which it's right on my shelf here. I don't, I got some others I was going to show. Liberty, Virtue and Progress, which I believe is Earl's first book. It is a book that, um, Anticipate James McPherson's book that many of our viewers know mm. for Cause and Comrade. But if you can get Liberty, Virtue, and Progress by Earl Hess, uh, it's well worth, I think, uh, uh, one's time to read it. It's very, very good. I want to go back, Erica, again. You did a nice job with, with the bayonet and how it functioned uh, in different ways for soldiers. But you made this important point that I'd like to stress again is the bayonet at the beginning of the war was central to that anticipation or that vision that combat would be highly dramatic it would be very individualized and very personal and that ultimately that courage and that bravery would decide the day now let me ask you it with the book psychic right with this is this book devoted a lot to battles and fighting. Like, if I'm gonna pick this up, what am I gonna mostly read about? You're gonna mainly read about the daily life of the soldier and how Cy changes, Cy, the main character, short for Josiah Clegg. He is, he enlists the army because there's this uh, really dashing looking officer walking down the street and he's a, he's a young man at this point and he thinks, wouldn't it be great if I was in that uniform and the society kind of is, you know, all enthusiastic um, for the men to sign up. So he signs up with this vision of glory and that, you know, the life in the army will be like comfortable and they'll be on feather beds and everything. And then once he gets there, it's the complete opposite of what he thinks it will be. And so the re really the novel kind of tracks how he comes from a naive soldier and then his hard shorty is kind of guiding th him through um, the war at the beginning and then by the war's end he's changed into a grown man and knows how to be an effective soldier and knows how to deal with things on his own.
Hey, tell us. Yes, well said. Hey, tell us about uh, about um, about si about about how he looks physically when he goes and joins. He said he becomes a man when he's a volunteer. Can you describe him for for the audience? Uh, Sai is a uh, chubby uh, <laughs> young man who he he goes into the army. Yeah, do you have the picture? Yeah. 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 I wish mm -hmm. we. I forgot about this picture, but there's that picture. I think it's in your book, Doctor Carmichael, yeah. of the him is. with all the all the knapsack and the blanket. And he's just completely overloaded. And there's this one. Uh, chapter in the book where Shorty's like, you really don't need all that stuff, and Sai is just bound and determined to carry all of it and because it has such sentimental value to what, everything at home. And so he eventually there's this one picture, it says how Sai like, came into the war and he's got all this stuff on him and then how Sai came out of the war and he's got just his basic stuff, no knapsack or anything. Mm -hmm. And you know, Erica, the importance of the uniform of what we would call the material culture, right? Uh, the the things that he carried, and, and I think he just hit it right on. Yeah. The beginning of the war, he wants to carry an apothecary basically on his back and his knapsack, and everything, as you said, has a sentimental value and a connection. And when we see in that change of his physical experience it, appearance as well as the changes in terms of what he carried, but we can see that transformation from volunteer, eager green volunteer, to a tough, hardened veteran who's at the core very much uh, a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about, and I'm going to find that, that picture that you mentioned of the transformation of Sai. I'll get that in just a moment. Can you talk to us a little bit about the relationship between Sai and Shorty? So first tell us about Shorty, Erica, and then tell us about, about how they uh, forged this pretty amazing bond. Yeah, so Sai and Shorty are enlisted in, I think, the 200th Indiana Company Q. <laughs> and, um, Which didn't exist, right? <laughs> There's no 200th um, Indiana, and certainly no Company Q. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I think Company Q, he picked that because it's supposed to be like a band of misfits. I believe I read somewhere in like the introduction. Um, but Sai is the naive young soldier and he doesn't really know what's going on. And Sh Shorty is an older, he's actually a tall um, soldier. But Shorty is an older veteran. He has, not veteran, but he has more experience than Shorty and he's much less sentimental than Shorty. I mean, than Sai. Sai Shorty is much less sentimental than Sai. And Shorty's much more pragmatic than Sai. And he is always coaching him on, you know, what he has to do to get by to survive. And um, just like guiding him along, making sure he doesn't get in fights with the older veterans. And they so become... So what are what what are some of the things that that uh, that Sai tells Shorty? Hey, or right, the Shorty tells Sai that you got to do. What's what's some of Shorty's wisdom that he that he offers? Um. Well, after their first battle, Sai is very discouraged because they had to bury their own soldiers in a mass grave, and Sai says something to the effect of, "You know, they deserve better." than to be buried like so many potatoes in a row. And Shorty says, you're, you're getting too sentimental about it. You you have to like, just keep moving on and accept that that's what, how it is. Right. And um, so Shorty helps him to kind of keep moving on and just not dwell on the moralistic aspects of the war at the first that this is how it is and they re can't really change it they don't have too much within their control they can only look out for themselves and each other as parts and um and then we'll let john go here but then quickly I, i'm glad that you said this because it's part of the title of the book <laughs> he said you know that they need to almost sort of uh, treasure this this special relationship 
they were pards. So talk to us a little bit about what does that exactly mean, that they were pards? So a pard is short for a partner. And what how Hinman describes it is that they became almost like brothers. And that is something that repeats in his letters as well, that besides their family relatives, they feel as close to their partners and, and their brothers in arms than a family member and that they really de develop this relationship with their fellow comrades because they've, you know, shared the same canteen, they've suffered through the same things, they've helped each other in battle, and there's really no other experience like it that can create that bond when you're going into battle and you want to trust the guy next to you that you're going to do your duty and he's going to do his. Mm -hmm. Erica, back in back in the day, <laughs> we, we we were uh, we as reenactors would read Hard Tag and Coffee, and we would sometimes get our hands on the Cy Clegg series, and we would read through them to greatly understand how to sleep in the field, uh, you know, what to eat, and and things like that. Um, what looking at it though we we learned those kind of things but we barely learned about the brutality of war in most cases other than those small little snippets where it's like a mass grave or something else later do you think that when this book came out or when when, when it's read later in the 90s when it's reprinted do you think it almost gave a kind of suppression to the brutality of war for for our viewing public or reading public um, or do you think it added to what was already out there? I think his main point is that it, it's interesting how there's the shift between the mass grave scene where he's saying, where Shorty says you have to get over, you know, seeing all those guys mm -hmm. laid out in the burial, but then he you know, at the end of the book, you have Shorty dies, and it's this very sentimental, um, you know, Victorian, what Victorians envisioned as the good death. And it's, you know, he try, he says a short little prayer for Shorty, and he, you know, tells him the victory is won. And it doesn't offer that brutal, you know, death. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure why he chose not to emphasize the brutality of it as much. Um, but I think he also wanted to show that, you know, the mundane aspects of it and, you know, the, the marching, the long marches and the wet weather were also like a huge part of being a soldier as well. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I think that the book does, um, a remarkable job in capturing the day-to-day -day grind of being a soldier and that every day is a day in which the quest to survive is paramount and so you know i expected in doing my work on the common soldier that i would not find so many men complain incessantly about the lack of pay and that the paymaster was, you know, months late. And so the men, again, on both sides were almost always on the brink of impoverishment. And that to get through the day, they could not, of course, rely on army rations. They were neither sufficient in quality or quality. Uh, and so you see, again, that these men are thinking in, in most of their energy and time. It's devoted to what we find in this book, creating innovative pragmatic strategies to be able to ensure that they can right, get through the day and especially when they're in the field and on the march uh, and continue the next day. And I, I think that Erica, you've already pointed about the importance of a part or a partner and it's the importance of messmates. And I don't want to ask too specific of a question, but I, so I'll broaden it a little bit uh, by asking you this. 
So I and Shorty developed this very powerful relationship. And, and I'm kind of speaking to what John's saying as well. It's, one could conclude that, God, this relationship seems um, too sentimental, too emotional, almost too neat in places, uh, because there's this growing dependency and affection that these two men have for each other. And so th here's now comes the question. What takeaways or understanding should we have about the nature of comradeship in the Civil War based on this book? Right? Or in other words, how does this book offer us some insights into the nature of comradeship? Um, I know that Hinman, he links, you know, the whole idea of the book is that they're fighting for very personal reasons. Um, that this war requires the utmost commitment to them, you know, potentially, you know, they, they lose their lives. And he links the Union uh, with his comrades. Um, in one of his letters, he says that they've been toiling, he said they've been together every day for years, toiling and battling for the glorious cause in one of his letters, uh, Hinnon's letters. Yeah. And in the novel, um, when Sai declares that he's going to re-enlist, then Shorty also decides he's going to re-enlist and says, I ain't going back on my part. And Shorty says earlier in the book that he's not even sure why he enlisted, that he didn't feel the strong tug of patriotism. But because Sai says, I'm going to re-enlist, then Shorty says, well, I'm going to too. So there's this you know, sense that they're just linked together. They're going to fight through it together. So, so I'm going to quickly interrupt. That's fascinating to me. So you're going to have to speculate here, I know, but I'm going to ask you to do it. Can you help me understand why Hinman's letters that you've already referenced and essentially quoted, that he is deeply patriotic, he believes in the Union cause, has no toleration for any kind of criticism of the war effort, considers people who do that to be traitorous and seditious, and yet in his novel, it appears that he has removed the motivation of these two men from high ideas and patriotism, right? Is, is my take, is that correct? And if it is, explain to me what in God's name happened? How can you go from taking the war as a war that is, again, for a political purpose that he clearly believed in to a post-war novel that seems utterly disconnected from the politics? I think he feels that there's a deep dif difference between the war that the politicians envisioned and the war that the soldiers actually fought. I think the reason, I mean, he expresses a dislike of politicians in his letters, but I think he draws upon that further in the novel because at the end of the novel, he points at the corruptness of the federal government um, and that this uh, candidate for the Congress, you know, says, I can get your pension raised only if you uh, support me and then I'll, you know, pass a bill trying to get your pension raised. And then the candidate just kind of leaves him at the wayside once he's elected and doesn't really do too much to get his pension amount raised, which is pension amount after taking years and years of, you know, trying to get this pension. It's $1.73 a month. And so at one point, the novel, he says something about how the, he feels like the government for which he fought so hard for and labored for so many years seems that it no longer cared for his services or something like that. Yeah. And so I think so I think he feels like he's essentially abandoned by uh, by the government and the politicians. So I think that's why he kind of distances himself from the politicians what they said the war was about and what the soldiers said the war was about. Erica, again, I just again, I, I think you again, nailed it. And I think you nailed it because I, it's clear that Hinman became disillusioned after the war to some degree. And he certainly became a little bit cynical toward the government, probably the issues he had with his pension, if he had any, certainly other men did. But we can see, again, one of the great challenges in dealing with soldier memoirs is that um, they often 
pushed aside uh, the politics of the war. And again, there's many different reasons why that happened. For some, they were writing uh, memoirs that were devoted to reconciliation and thus they didn't want to get into any uh, sort of sticky situation that might involve that the war was over slavery and the cause of union. But in Hinman's case, he reminds me a little bit of uh, a Hoosier writer, Ohio cannot claim that, uh, is Ambrose Bierce, right? And Ambrose Bierce uh, wrote uh, these really powerful accounts of his war experience. And I think one can see in those accounts uh, that he also turned a little cynical. And uh, if you read you know, into that, it would lead one to conclude that he wasn't very patriotic at all during the war, which I don't think was, was the case. Mm -hmm. Eric, I know you had some other documents you wanted to share with us. Did you want to, one in particular right now that you'd like for us to see? Uh, I'm not sure how well it will turn up. Um, That's on me. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, well, the the one, the two images I have were we already discussed were about the mass grave scene yeah. and Shorty's death, and kind of comparing those two between you know you're getting too sentimental and, you know, then there's the very sentimental uh, aftermath of Shorty's death. Um, I was going to add to the, you know, just really quickly to the politicians, sure. you know, and the soldiers. There's this one quote where um, Shorty, uh, he says he's going to stick, out, stick it out with the army until the end. And he says, I'm going to keep pegging away all the same as if I was full of patriotism as those red hot speechifers up north that go around slopping over. But they're mighty careful not to join the army themselves. So that's another um, distinguishing characteristic of this book is that the dialogue is written in this this dialect that's this you have to read it out loud sometimes for it to make sense. Yeah. Um, but in that passage, he He's saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to keep going ahead as if I'm as full of patriotism as the politicians. But he says, hey, but the politicians, you don't see them enlisting in the army. And so I think that's another factor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but you've, you've, I think, also captured something of great value in this book, and that is you know, the dialect. Who's your talk or Midwestern speak, right? It, is, uh, it, it gives you, again, that sense of immediacy. And I also should note is the sketches that we've, showed a few. Here's the one, the transformation of Psy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, again, the rookie soldier, he's got everything, uh, including the kitchen sink on his backpack, yeah. and then the transformation into a tough, efficient veteran with just a blanket roll. Is again, the book, I don't God knows how many illustrations are in that book, Erica, but they have to be pushing 75 to 100, I would think. I mean, there are uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty remarkable. Yeah, actually, I found out um, today that actually Cy Clegg was a character who first uh, showed up in the National Tribune, which is the oh. veterans newspaper. Yeah. Um, and that the same illustrator who did the newspaper continued that for the book, for Hinman's book. For Hinman's book. Yeah. yeah. Erica, uh, when she was at the uh, Civil War Institute, uh, had the opportunity to meet Hinman's, and I'll just let you take it away from here, one of Hinman's relatives. Can you sort of tell us about that and, wow. and the correspondence uh, that you've had with him? Yeah, so when I was at the uh, working at the Civil War Institute last summer, um, I met uh, Kirk Hinman, and it turned out that he was the great-grandson of uh, Wilbur Hinman, the writer of Corporal Cycleg, and, and I got to talking to him about the novel and a little bit of the research that I was doing, and um, he gave me his card and, you know, said that he might give me uh, a tour of Johnson's Island, because he also lives in the Cleveland area, and um, he also gave me um, one of the a, a typed up copy of one of Hinman's letters and a few other uh, documents. And we went, me and my dad, and he uh, he took us around a tour of Johnson's Island uh, where uh, Confederate uh, prisoners were held. Um, 
near Lake Erie. Did he have, um, any, so, stories, did he have any stories at all about, about his great grandfather? Any family uh, stories he passed down? No, he did say that most of the relatives have moved out of the Ohio area and um, that he is descended from one of the sons. I can't remember which, but Wilbur Hinman had two sons and one daughter and he's descended from one of the sons. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. So Erica, uh, we three historians who are in this conversation right now and some of the historians who are in the comment section, we go through Cy Clegg and, and his pard and all the other works that came out at this time. How do you think we as historians should uh, embrace these kinds of books and what's it do for us as historians? Well, I think that this book, especially in, you know, it, it gives it a story format, which, uh, you know, hardtack and coffee um, doesn't quite do as well. And um, I think the fact that he has it laid out as a novel really shows how, you know, the young soldier kind of goes from being really naive, like too naive and not knowing anything and growing up to be this, you know, well experienced trained soldier. And I think it really, you know, shows w w how much of a personal commitment these soldiers had, even if they were like shorty and they said, they didn't really have much patriotism behind them, but then it's shown in how much they sacrifice and how much they suffer for the union and for each other. And I think it just does a really good job, especially with the illustrations of showing what exactly that life is like, especially Hinman's goal at the time was to show those civilians, you know, war it wasn't, you know, this romantic thing. and. Here's all the mundane uses for all our equipment and the canteens and bayonets and stuff. And I think it what, what does a really you, good job. What was with the canteen half? Do you remember the various uses for a canteen? Uh, First, the problem think, was they weren't soldered well together. So they were <laughs> this sort of junky equipment that frustrated the soldiers. So they could break it in half and then they would use the canteen half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I remember that he like, uses the canteen half, I think, like to like wash his face or something yeah, like that. Digging. And yeah, for digging for entrenches. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Or a frying pan as well. Mm -hmm. It's it's things that you wouldn't think it would be used for. Right. Trying yeah, to find where, we, this is where we got our ideas reenacting years right. ago. It was we used to carry around canteen halves and stuff because we read it in Cy Clegg or we read it in Hardtack and Coffee. It influenced There's so many reenactors. So here's Hard Tech and Coffee. I can see there's a glare. Hard Tech and Coffee, Josh Billings, still in print, in yeah. paperback, I believe, and yeah. well worth everyone's attention with Cycling and his part. And I think that the other thing uh, to mention is we talked a little bit about combat in a book, again, that is still in print. I always get questions about uh, PTSD and Civil War soldiers, and there's been much uh, writing about that subject, but the individual who I believe uh, initiated this inquiry is Eric Dean Jr. And it's an interesting title, there we go, Shook Over Hell, uh, which offers some comparisons to Vietnam veterans. Shook Over Hell, it's quite good. Erica, you've read this or no? I can't remember. Have you seen it? Uh, we've read part of it for your class, yes. I've read part of it as well, yeah. Eric it's Jr. a good book, yes. It is, it is. Yeah. Again, it's, it's, it's a must. And then one that I think that doesn't get as much attention as it deserves, is War Stories by Francis. Yeah, we read that too. We read that, yeah. Who's that by feet? Francis Clark with an E. She actually is, teaches in Australia. Okay. This is, again, a very important book to understand mm. how Northern soldiers inhabited uh, a culture of sentimentalism. Uh, and I think, again, it's, it's, it is a, it is a uh, piece. It should be read after um, a Battle Courage. Uh, she takes issue with a lot of the conclusions uh, in, in in battle courage. I know we might have some questions here, but I'd like to get one more uh, to oh, Eric. Go ahead, Pete. Erica. We have a lot of comments, <laughs> so, so go ahead. You have time. All right. um, again, I'm struck in this book by the quest to survive, 
which required it required them to sign shorty. It required them to steal from comrades. Uh, again, the level of thievery was really astonishing, and that they were almost always on guard, um, knowing that uh, you really couldn't trust anyone except your pard. And so you have this incredible bond that we've already mentioned between these two men and how much they needed each other to survive. And that that created this, you get an emotional connection. And so now here's the question. A lot of people say, well, that doesn't surprise me, that that is the universal sort of almost condition right, of men at war. And now we should say women and men at war. So does this book, Erica, should we draw conclusions and say, hey, these are just kind of universal truths throughout time, throughout military history, or would you caution against them? Sorry, my internet crashed. Could you repeat your question? <laughs> From the top. Yeah. So um, when we think about the relationship between Sai and Shorty, and we see again this great bond. Many people might say that's not surprising because one can find that intimacy, that connection, that dependency between men, and now we should say men and women at war. And so what we find in Cyclic and his part is we find a book that speaks to universal truths of soldiering, that you can find that connection, that sense of comradeship throughout time are you comfortable with that conclusion? Or do you think that maybe, you know, it should be refined a little bit from what I've just said? Um, I mean, I think the idea of Cycleg is that, you know, having that person to depend upon that, you know, will be at your side and suffer you and suffer with you and cheer you up and guide you through, you know, the unknown. And that I think it's very like, um, I think it's very, at least comforting to sigh as like a very young boy to have like the older shorty looking after him and, you know, kind of like, you know, guiding him away from dangers of battle. And um, So I'm going press on that. So good. That's a great description. Erica, are you comfortable then for someone to conclude, yes, what we see in Sai and Shorty, that's the nature of comradeship. It always has been, always will be. And if you want to understand the military experience of war, there you have it. It's about comradeship. Put aside these ideas. Put aside that these men were thinking about politics. What these men thought about was, let's get through the day. Let's survive. And guess what? We got to do it together. And I'm now fighting, not for my nation. I, I'm fighting now for the guy or the woman who's next to me. How do you how do you think that's a good conclusion? Problematic? I think that's a good conclusion, but I I, I think that Hinman also he I think he also hits upon he links that it's it's very important to him that they're fighting for each other, but he also reaffirms that commitment to the union and, and the novel. Um, he, he doesn't he doesn't stay away from that, even though he voices his opinion, right. uh, negative opinion of the government that he fought for. He still believes that his sacrifice is worthwhile for the union. Okay. Yeah. Erica, there's someone in the comments who took my question. So I'll let them ask you this. <laughs> uh, because you're because you're a student, this is a very important question to ponder. Uh, what does she wish to do following her time as an undergrad career path? You've studied under P. Carmichael and others. Have you, uh, do you have any ideas for, after you're done at Fredericksburg and you finish up at Gettysburg, do you have any ideas for paths for the future or are you still kind of open-minded about the whole thing? I'm still open-minded about the whole thing. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm very fortunate that I get to go to Fredericksburg this summer and I'm hoping that that will give me idea if, you know, I want to go on the track of public history, um, something along those lines. And I just want to see how that goes for the summer and, you know, see if I really enjoy how, how that works out. Mm -hmm. Right. That's awesome. As her advisor, I can say 
whatever course she selects, whether it be the academic route in grad school or public history, Erica is going to do exceptionally well. Uh, we just have to get her more culturally up to date. And of course, I only have one more year, two more years uh, to, to do my job there. But otherwise, you know, she is like so many of the students that I have at Gettysburg College, uh, smart, they're dedicated. And again, I just want to brag just a little bit about her. You know, the very fact that she makes connections to what other scholars have written and she extracts their ideas and understands the importance of ideas. Erica, we've talked, John and I, about uh, issues relating to public history and academic history. And there's too many people out there who are, I think, badly misinformed when they try to make this sort of adversarial relationship between public historians and academics, and that public historians, you know, they're the ones that tell the dramatic, exciting stories, and it's the academics who, you know, just talk about the book and the high ideas. You know, I think that that is uh, an unfair and inaccurate generalization. And it's my hope, Erica, is that this summer that you'll be just one more example of how going to a place like the Sunken Road is a place where you can give a powerful and dramatic recounting of December the 13th. But I also hope to God, and I'm quite sure you won't do this, and that is just simply let people go thinking, well, this is just one grand tragedy. Uh, rather, I hope that you can raise some very important questions about the meaning of that slaughter. And to raise those questions requires ideas. And so, you know, good public historians are public historians who know historiography, and they know how to talk about it, as you did tonight, without, of course, hitting people over the head with a bunch of book titles like I did. <laughs> there are various books out there as well. And I'll just throw this out there, John, and we'll have to debate this maybe when uh, we get Jim Brumall on the show. Erica, I think you're going to get a lot of folks who are going to reflect upon what Union soldiers did on December 13th, and you're going to talk about the sacrifice and how these comrades, these survivors came together. And people will say, well, that is been the truism throughout history. The governments getting their men slaughtered for no good reason. And the cynicism that I encountered when I did sunken walk, sunken road walks, I heard it all the time, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate because what I think Cyclic and his part do better than any book I've seen, what Cyclic and his part do is that they remind us that every historical moment is distinct and different. And for anyone to suggest to me that the Civil War soldier is no different than a Vietnam soldier. And I've heard people say, they're just like us, they miss their family, how they love their comrades. You know, yes, but their world, as this book demonstrates, radically different. You can't find a US soldier who's gone months without pay. You can't find a US soldier today whose wives or families or husbands were back on the home front don't have a support system. You can't find a US soldier today that doesn't have within the army, a medical community that will help them with physical issues, with mental health issues. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I can tell you this. Hinman in part was disillusioned because when he came home, he had a pension system and that's about it. And during the war, as this book illustrates, time and time again, on the brink of impoverishment because the government had not paid them in time. They got in debt to settlers. They were forced to steal, not just from civilians, but from each other. That's the world. It's not the world today. And so I hope that when people want to make these grand universal generalizations about soldiering, I hope that we as historians will remind them every historic moment or period is unique and distinct. They like that I'm talking about the side of the book. It's kind of weird, isn't it? I would say that that is partially true, that I think people want to find that they can relate to you know people of another age even though it is drastically different um i know i did two pro soldier profiles um on for killed at gettysburg and the one octave marcel um you know his family was completely destitute and his he was sending back his wages to his father and his father you know after the war his son is killed at gettysburg and his father after the war you know his clothes are falling apart. His neighbors testify and, you know, he gets, wow. you know, he gets like a pension of like $8 a month and, you know, and that's, that's not enough to live by. And then 
um, just really quickly in terms of relatability, when I was researching Elijah Hayden of the 8th Ohio, who was killed at Gettysburg, um, I thought that his letters really rang a relatable tone. It's his letters to his young daughter. And, you know, he's, he's trying to hide the fact that, you know, they have such a hard life on the front, but his, his letters to his daughter are just so heartbreaking. And, you yes. know, he, he, he's just like con so concerned about how his daughter's doing and trying to hide, you know, any feeling, questions about his own health. I'm feeling so helpless, right, to do anything. Very quickly, John, if I don't mind, for Eric and in with this, could you quickly tell the audience what is Killed at Gettysburg and where can they find it? And, uh, and, and I'll just note that the research behind Killed at Gettysburg is done by Gettysburg College students. We take them down to the National Archives. They spend a day down there uh, working with the staff. It's a great experience for our students. And again, I will be shameless to promote what this college does. Find another college if you're interested in history in which you can take a day trip down to the National Archives. I'm hardly the only one who does that. Many of my peers and colleagues do that at Gettysburg College. Original research that you then write and then get it out to the public. So take it away, Erica. What is Killed at Gettysburg? So Killed at Gettysburg is a digital project that um, first year students do and Civil War Institute fellows do. Um, and we research, you know, um, a soldier that's fairly unknown who was killed at um, the battle. And we go deep in the, you know, Ancestry.com records, uh, Fold 3 military records. We go to the National Archives and we just try to undig as much information as we can about that soldier, you know, how their background, what happened to them in the battle and you know, how they're memorialized or their regiment was memorialized. Mm -hmm. And they just need to Google killed at Gettysburg. And it's uh, yeah, there it a is. Ashley, Dr. Ashley Lusky, yes. uh, that our audience is familiar with. She's the one that is uh, overseeing that program. Yeah. Erica, it's so good to see you. I will see you in a month or so. I'm going to come down to Gettysburg, or time to Gettysburg. I'm going to come to Frederick. <laughs> Can I go on your walk? <laughs> Are you going to let me go on your walking tour? Yeah. What? Can I go on your walking tour? Yeah. So I you know? like distant walking tour. Yeah. Six feet. Yeah, six feet. But it, it, even with that distance, I can fire away some tough questions, can I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, let him, don't let him hijack it, Erica. <laughs> I won't do that. That's not in me. Erica, again, thank you so much. Excited about your research. Excited to read your next draft of your paper and hoping that it will get published soon as well. John, who do we have for Monday? Is it? I didn't look at our schedule. Good God. I, think I didn't either. I was more worried about Cy Clegg tonight, and I didn't look at the schedule. <laughs> it's I, didn't, I didn't want to get caught up in, like, you know, I didn't want Erica to get a gotcha question in on me. And yeah. I, buddy. It's either Kevin Levin or Megan Kate Nelson. Oh, no, it's Megan Kate Nelson Monday. Megan Kate Nelson is on Monday? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Megan Kate Nelson is on Monday. Three cornered war. Three cornered yes, war. Yes, the three cornered war. <laughs> and he rolls out of frame. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. That yeah. is Megan, this is great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, Megan. I forgot. That was my fault. Well, we recovered nicely. Wow. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. But Erica, thank you for being on. It was awesome having you on here. We've worked together in the field a couple times now. And uh, you, you did great with those videos that we did for, for the CWI conference that didn't go over this year, <laughs> but it was great to have you out there doing that. And uh, I really look forward to what you're going to do in the future. And I'm probably going to make my way down to Fredericksburg too, because I love Fredericksburg. So I'm probably going to have to come down and get a tour as well. So don't pick on me too much when I show up. It, 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 dinner, dinner at Sammy T's. I love Sammy T's on Caroline Street. It's uh, mm. a good place to eat Fredericksburg, but Sammy T's is awesome. Yes. Yes. Shout out to them. They're not a sponsor tonight, but shout out. neither yeah. is the band Grimes. Erica, are you gonna listen to Grimes after this? No. No. <laughs> no after party with that. Yeah, she seems so sweet and nice, but then really? Oh, yeah. I'll keep trying. I'll keep She's trying. throwing shade at you. <laughs> She's throwing <laughs> shade at me. That's right. Yes. Thank you again, Erica, for being on. Really appreciate it. Pete, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, everyone, for all the comments. There's a ton of comments in there to get to. Uh, not too many questions, but a lot of comments, which is great. So we'll have to get to those in a, 
at a later time here. But uh, thank you all for watching again, as you, you guys often do. I see names that pop up every time we go live. So thank you for that. Really appreciate that. And we will see you Monday evening at 7 o'clock with Megan Kate Nelson. Take care, everybody.